This. Hello, everyone. All right, so we're going to go ahead and start. If everyone can take their seat. Everyone's sitting. That's great. I was scared someone would be standing. Um, okay, so this is Su Ms. Suzette Shaw, who's our wonderful speaker for this room. Uh, she is a feminist activist and resident of Skid Row. Suzette Shaw, um, so not long ago, she was actually homeless in Skid Row, but now she lives there currently housed. And she used to study health science education and mental health over 30 years ago and previously worked in human services and resources. So since being displaced to Skid Row, her focus has been mental health advocacy, and I won't take up any more of her time. So we can just give her a round of applause. Um, I'm honored that you all came to join us this morning. Thank you so much. Um, I may need um, this. Yeah, and where's that clicker? This out while you go. Okay, great. And the clicker, yeah, just so. The clicker's right here. I mean, there was a the mouse, I guess. Oh, it's right yeah. Okay, great. So, thank you all. Okay, so um, I'm sure all of you have heard the phrase, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. What if your boots can no longer weather the unknowing storm ahead of you? What if the straps have aged over the course of time, now just a single thread? I have gone through many displacements, years, decades. Nevertheless, I have always managed to keep my head above water, stay afloat, fight the good fight, pull myself up by my bootstraps. Thank you. In June 2012, I lost what had been my home for approximately seven years. Okay. Excuse me. Sorry about this, guys. This will be much smoother in every other room. <laughs> in June 2012, I lost what had been my home for approximately seven, year, seven years. Court ordered to leave. I packed up the last of my belongings and departed, and departed in the late hours of the night, having no idea as to where I was going. This time was different, barely hanging on by a thread. The blows kept coming. As I attempted to stay afloat, my arms flapped. I was drowning, with my head barely above the water. I needed a lifeline, but the ones being thrown to me were tattered threads rather than a rope. My flapping arms were beyond sore. I had grown weary. Thank you. I was, my spirit was broken. Emotionally and physically, I was eroding. My family moved uh, from Hope, Arkansas to Yuma, Arizona in 1950s. They lived at the now defunct compress where most black families dwelled who had migrated within, the time, within that time period moving into the city. They continued to uh, be neighbors with folks who had moved with them from the compress. Black folks who had migrated with them from Arkansas in the 50s were now uh, their neighbors in Yuma, Arizona. At the compress, they not only dwelled together, but they worked together in the cotton fields. Although my mother to this day has proud memories of her keen intellect of a photogenic memory, working on the school newspaper in Arkansas, she nevertheless became a teenage mother at the age of, at the four, age of 14, bringing my eldest sister into the world, subsequently causing her to have to drop out of school. Like many other black women of that, of that, of that time residing in Yuma, Arizona, she went from working in the fields to cleaning white folks' homes. Years later, even describing how one of her domestic superiors required her to use a toothbrush to clean the toilets. From there, she went to working as a cook at a historical Mexi Mexican restaurant, back in the day when black folks were required to come through the back door in Mexican establishments, and, other, and as well as other establishments. My mother continued to further herself in school and in employment, Subsequently, she would years later be offered a fellowship to study at Harvard, but as a single mother of six, had to turn it down. Nevertheless, she would continue 
to gain stature moving into social service and community action related to anti-poverty programs. This was approximately the late 60s. My mother worked hard, long hours, even traveling, and forth, uh, traveling back and forth throughout Arizona. This leaving my, el my eldest siblings on their own and my twin sister and I um, as the youngest under the care of our grandparents, her parents. I want to show you clips of um, my presentation is we can no longer talk about equality and empowerment. And um, with that, I just want to share some photos of uh, my childhood and upbringing. And this is um, when my, um, my twin sister and I and my siblings um, um, went to uh, Disneyland for the first time, came here to Disneyland. Um, this is me approximately five years old morning, um, Christmas morning, um, uh, with my uncle there and siblings um, putting together our, our presents for the... And uh, this is my twin sister and I, uh, approximately uh, 12 years of age, um, at an aviation um, uh, show at um, YMCAS um, in Yuma, Arizona. Um, there are two main military bases in, in the Yuma area. Um, my family um, went on a lot of camping um, outings over the summers, and this is um, me at a camping outing with my Uncle Bo, who's now deceased. And um, I was... Um, Homecoming queen, um, uh, I was class, uh, homecoming attended for three years and homecoming queen um, my senior year, wrote the float all three years, was class president from seventh to 10th grade, uh, president of my junior achievement award winning companies uh, my junior and senior year. Um, I, I won three out of four awards in volleyball my junior year. And um, those are some of, um, some of my high school pictures. Um, I show you those because I wanna just um, reflect on um, the young girl who was so impressionable and uh, so precocious and, and you know and I and I think back and I think um, I wish someone would have said to her then um, I pray that no one ever steals your joy I pray that the innocence that you know today is the innocence that you know tomorrow I pray that for every dark cloud a rainbow follow a rainbow follows and that for um, Every dark tunnel leads you to um, lightness, brightness, and most importantly, insightfulness. Here I am in college. Um, I believe it was like my first or second year at ASU. Um, my eldest sister had a Chevy Chevette when she had gone to a uh, University of Arizona. My mother had bought for her, and um, she bequeathed it to my twin sister and I, and, um, and that was our first vehicle. Actually, I should take that back. My initial, uh, my, um, my bicycle, my Nashiki, I called it my, um, my Cadillac. And then this was my second mode of transportation. So, um, oops. Um, um, I'm gonna go a little bit further and then I'll come back into some more pictures. Uh, this is my fam, my, uh, my siblings and I uh, with my auntie at our, uh, my uncle's 70th birthday party. And, um, and then I'll get to this picture in a moment. I shouldn't leave up the, you know, but anyway, I'll leave that. Uh, yeah. Good old days, anyway. Um, so my mother worked hard, long hours, even traveling back and forth throughout um, Arizona. Uh, list leaving my siblings on, on, on their own and my twin sister and I uh, as the youngest with the care, under the care of our grandparents. Um, Devoted to all tasks, she trailblazed as a community leader, leader, thus implementing the food stamp program throughout my hometown as well as throughout the state of Arizona, bringing legal aid into the same manner uh, to my home region and state. In addition, um, she was director of social services for Native Americans. As, um, as far as we know to date, she's been the only black woman in the state of Arizona to have been a city administrator on the level she was. She changed the chartership. Um, of Summerton, Arizona from a town to a city. Uh, she was appointed even by state uh, boards and s state governors and, and board committees of leadership um, um, and to officials um, and to positions um, within the state as well. In addition, my mother worked for HUD. Um, when my twin sister and I were 12 years of age in the sixth grade, she sued HUD and the city of Yuma for racial and sexual discrimination. Subsequently, she was blacklisted from further human services, um, city and government positions. At 40 years of age, with two kids in college and four more to care for at home, she traded in her suits and heels for work boots, work jeans, and t-shirts. 
so that she could work on a jackhammer in the dry, sweltering heat of Yuma, Arizona. My mother's much publicized lawsuit didn't go before a judge until my twin sister and I were in college. I can recall sitting in the Phoenix courtroom and hearing the white mi middle-aged female judge telling her, ma'am, I believe you, but the statute of limitations has run its course. At that time, I saw what life was left in her dream. After leaving my mother's um, home in Yuma, Arizona at the um, tender age of 18, still very impressionable and naive to the world. Um, um, after graduating uh, high school, um, my twin sister and I moved to Tempe, Arizona, picture I just showed you, to attend Arizona State University. By the way, um, Arizona State was about the same size at that time as my hometown, just to kind of give you a little uh, contrast. So Yuma was approximately 50,000, I believe, and Arizona State was about 40,000. Um, after leaving my small rural town, I then lived in urban and suburban America, from Arizona to California. Well over 20 years after leaving, uh, living out in the world, I then returned to my mother's home after job loss, back-to-back -back car accidents within a three-month time period. No fault of my own. I also not only suffered continued displacement, but trauma through, throughout all of this. Nevertheless, I continued to try and find my way pulling myself up by my bootstraps. I lived all over Northern California, from Silicon Valley, Bay Area, which included Mountain View, Redwood City, Palo Alto, Burlingame, um, uh, to name a few, um, and um, doing um, often administrative, temporary, corporate contract work, ranging in industries from um, securities, venture capital groups, biotech, even event management. My long um, commutes had me up before the crack of dawn, leaving home and anywhere from 5 a.m. traveling into San Francisco, but even further along the peninsula to Palo Alto and San Jose in search of the American dream, hoping for opportunities in industries and work environments where I didn't fit the corporate culture. No matter how much I suited up to fit in, the fact of the matter was I was never going to fit in. I somehow managed to keep my boots strapped, but over time, the laces were wearing down, were weighing down, feeling more like ropes. Uh, this was a true poem um, around um, uh, my first years uh, living in the Bay Area. We came home from my uncle's 70th birthday party. I'm terrible with this thing. Can you help me with this? Move we'll to the next slide. Yeah. Okay. Okay, that's even me better. So um, this is um, uh, my twin sister and I. Um, our eldest sister had worked for a um, high tech company, and um, uh, when we first lived there, she was still working for that company. And subsequently, um, she got a job transfer to uh, Australia. And so um, we were living around De Anza College, if you're familiar at all with Sunnyvale and Silicon Valley area. And then from there, my twin sister and I got this um, apartment, this amazing apartment in Mountain View, California. It was very, very spacious. Um, now some of the major tech companies are actually um, in Mountain View, California. And so that was, I was, um, I was uh, working for, I believe, Stryker Endoscopy around that time. I was a marketing coordinator, I believe, around that time uh, for Stryker Endoscopy. Um, and Stryker Endoscopy, if you're not familiar with the, they were the uh, inventor of the cannula um, for orthopedic surgery. And then I went on to work uh, many years later. Uh, I worked um, for Neiman Marcus, and at this time I was living in Redwood City, California. Okay, go back to that. I'll just leave you there with my little face. So I worked in public relations at Neiman Marcus, produced um, high-end fashion shows and philanthropic events. Um, Toxic work environments, more discrimination than my young, impressionable, naive self should have ever witnessed, let alone been victim of. Some behave like class clansmen in suits, women who seem like housewives straight out of the help. Narcissistic, predators, misogynistic pimps, and khakis and suits left my spirit crying. A girl, ch 
child ain't safe in a world full of men. A mixture of slave labor and corporate prostitution for a Girl Friday fee, and if lucky, permanent status and health benefits. So many office bullies, including bitter women threatened by my black skin and brick house body, strain, most, of, most often uh, working two to three jobs to get by, seven days a week, juggling them all all or um, juggling them all or one salary corporate position with several jobs looped into one, leaving my friends to jokingly say, how many jobs you have today, mom? Um, working, working consumed my life and, and my very existence. A quality, a quality of life was Quality of life was a term um, really more conceived for uh, rich white junior league women in the high-end su suburbs of the peninsula who could stroll through Neiman Marcus shopping and lunching. I was depleted before I even knew what the word meant. Unfulfilled yet no time nor money to return to school, the straps on my boots further weighing me down. I secretly pondered in my head, is this all there is? At this time, I was working for Neiman Marcus. It, believe it a lot, like it was like the most stressful job in the world. It was like amazing. It was amazing. I was like, you know, working with designers like Michael Kors and all kinds of stuff. But then, like the women that I was working around, like they were so threatened by me and and things that I went through, like them leaving notes on my desk and um, basically like letting me know I wasn't welcome. And um, I constantly was um, being turned into. Um, Human resources, um, uh, even though my skirts were the same as many other women, we, um, we weren't allowed to wear pants. This is in the 90s. We weren't allowed to wear pants. So you could either wear a, um, a suit or, um, or a dress. And my skirts were oftentimes, my dresses were oftentimes right above my knee. And you always have to wear pantyhose, if you're, any of you still know what that means. <laughs> pantyhose and all that kind of stuff. But um, I constantly would get called into human resources and told my attire was inappropriate. And, um, and the human resources director um, and um, my boss, who was a public relations director, um, they oftentimes would um, sit there and um, berate me and tell me that, I know you think that um, you deserve um, respect, but, um, but you don't, you have to earn respect. And it was just a constant, um, you know, really kind of damaging of my soul. Um, in 2003, at the age of 40, I returned to Yuma after two decades of being, a, of being gone. No pension, no 401k. I left home at 18, full of hope and sunshine. I returned 22 years later, broken, um, with a purple bruise and swollen spirit. Anxiety, depression, and stress that left me far far too many cortisol inches of fat around my expanded waistline and gargantuan breast. Yuma now was now foreign to my adult self who has spent much time, um, much time, um, has spent very little time there in the, all the years that I have been gone. Unknown to many who had remembered the fit and perky young version of myself, nevertheless, even though I was a foreigner to them and them to me, I, um, um, I could. I finally um, felt that maybe I could buy a home. Living in the Bay Area, I had gone through many um, ups and downs. And um, um, living in Redwood City, I had um, uh, lived at. Uh, I lived lived in a Victoria home for about seven years. Was working for a biotech company and running uh, an event management business on the side. Um, my um, the president of our biotech company said that there would never be layoffs. Um, and then we had a layoff. Uh, so they laid off like m most of the workforce and uh, or half of the workforce, I should say. And um, my I had these uh, Italian uh, landlords in Redwood City that um, I was constantly dealing with harassment and so forth. And um, um, but there were never the it was a it was a beautiful home, but there were never any. Um, any work that was done to the place. So um, I actually brought some of that to the attention of um, the city. And then um, they uh, ruled that the place was like not habitable. So then they were uh, caused the uh, landlords to um, subsequently have to do work. 
And then they decided to evic evict me because um, I had filed that. And then told the, the city that um, they needed that space for a family member. So around the same time, I lost my job, I lost my home, and I was, I was just broken. Um, and I had this amazing doctor, um, and I told him, I didn't even know, like, I just know that I said, I'm, I'm barely hanging on, like, I'm just really depressed. And, um, and he's like, I have just the thing for you. And he put me on Prozac, and I didn't even know what Prozac was or any of that stuff at the time. So I was on Prozac. And um, I had never done um, any mind-altering drugs, uh, illicit or prescription. Um, so I thought, okay, well, I was in my late 30s or so, and I thought, well, I think I need this, so I think maybe I should do this. But, and he said, I'm going to put you on the lowest dosage possible, which he did. Um, so, but I was living, um, I still had health insurance at that time, and then I had for, for maybe a um, few to several months after I lost my job, and then I had moved to Sacramento because um, I couldn't find sustainable work in, um, in, in the Bay Area. So I'm sleeping on friends' couches and floors and, you know, invading their space. And it was creating a whole dynamic of, you know, <clears throat> crunching, you know, it just wasn't a good friendly environment after a while. So I ended up moving to Sacramento to be closer to my sisters. And, um, and I remember uh, my um, uh, being on Prozac and feeling like my body felt different like I felt my body felt foreign to me um, I always described it as I felt unisexual I didn't feel like my I didn't I didn't feel really woman like or what have you and um, and I remember then as um, the prescription ran out and I had nothing else um, to you know substitute it with and um, I went through like my body just went through like like it was really really bad I I, I um, I actually felt um, uh, suicidal, and so um, that was my experience with bio, uh, with um, Prozac and being on a um, um, prescription of it, and uh, for the first time in um, my late thirties. Um, I um, I never went back on Prozac, um, and so I uh, then was dealing with having to cope with um, all of my different um, uh, pain and depression um, on my own. Um, and uh, at times I was self-medicating and uh, taking like St. George's, uh, St. John's wort, um, something like that my mother had recommended that I take, so I was doing that. So, um, and, um, so now here I am, um, after two back-to-back -back car accidents, uh, being back home in Yuma, Arizona at 40 years of age, um, I thought I could maybe buy a home. Um, Yuma was very low. Um, the income, I mean, the um, cost of living um, was low, and housing prices um, had been low for many years and decades. But around the same time that I ended up moving home, um, Yuma was a border rural community, which had um, always been affordable. Um, and I thought, I won't need much money to buy a house. Wrong. Around the same time, um, a lot of snowbirds who normally came to Yuma over the winter months um, had decided to make a Yuma home and were buying home homes. So a lot of snowbirds came from Canada, Washington, and other cold climate areas across the country um, and decided to buy, migrate to Yuma during the winter months to purchase property um, there as well. After all, where they came from on their retired pensions, um, they could pay cash and get in their fancy uh, RVs and come and go at their will. In addition, Yuma was, um, was and is a good old boy and gal town uh, where family name, class, and race matter. And this conservative military border Bible Belt community of the South where, West where um, Catholic and Mormon roots run deep. Um, um, and I referred also to like um, uh, Baptist guilt, is, which my family were, um, uh, as a cult. But um, black folks uh, normally... Um, Tract is only 3% th of the population. Therefore, uh, they never truly were factoring into the workforce when it came to sustainable economic development and, and um, employment opportunities. Um, your family name could also keep you out more easily than it could make you part of the inner circle. Um, the Howard Griffith effect of not knowing your place, not only closed doors, it slammed them closed with the lock uh, to follow. 
people would literally um, come to me and tell me um, not to tell people who my m mother was, to instead use my grandparents' name, to which I would retort into staying back at them. No wonder she is so fucked up, having a friend like you. After all, my mother's, my mother's and my relationship was beyond toxic, but I would never deny that she was my mother. Um, so to say I was emotionally, physically, phys physically fragile and broken would be an understatement. Um, toxic jobs as well as living environments, safe, uh, look, safe looking, pristine suburban um, white neighborhoods where I was yelled at on the uh, on my morning walks. Nigger! Stalked corporate professional fam family man who kissed their soccer wives goodbye in the morning, who became different people from nine to five. Monthly um, high rents, monthly increases, the day in the life of a, uh, of a girl Friday, tip days which blurred the lines, confused too often for fun and the climate culture. Nevertheless, this had become my norm and what my broken spirit had, come, had become conditioned to tolerate. This is what they call pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. My spirit cried, is this it? Um, I had really terrible things that I went through in Yuma, um, even more, even as bad of that I had gone through um, in, in, in the Bay Area all those years. Um, um, discrimination um, uh, that was terrible and that's for another time but um, um, so um, I lost my job April 23rd 2010 where I was a human resources manager for a business processing New York based company I had been working with a uh, um, loan officer to uh, get my credit and, and check in. I was um, actually looking to buy a home at the time um, that I was actually um, laid off from my job Nevertheless, I put two years into diligently trying to find sustainable employment as well as um, um, very involved with the philanthropic work that I did for a restorative justice first time juvenile offender program. I was hoping that um, all the work in the, um, that I was putting into that program was maybe going to um, land me a position um, and um, we were working on um, uh, a nonprofit, and so I was the uh, I was the uh, the initial um, executive director for that nonprofit, and um, I was uh, chair of the steering committee overseeing uh, six uh, committees in the in the community and so forth. Um, I volunteered like crazy. Um, I was also uh, the um, face of my hometown city. Um, of uh, they had a, um, uh, a federal housing. Um, uh, event that they did annually, and I was the face of um, and PR person for for that event. I would sit around the table on a weekly, uh, bi-monthly basis with people on a city, county, and federal le level in relations to um, uh, in relations to um, housing. Yet when um, and even uh, the um, even the the legal aid attorney uh, sat on the same. Um, same board. Nevertheless, when um, I ended up um, getting my eviction notice, nobody was able to help me save my home. No one could help me. And um, I remember pleading with the legal aid attorney um, to go to court with me because I was afraid to go by myself, to which she said, I have a doctor's appointment and I can't go. And I remember thinking, God, my mother brought legal aid, <laughs> you know, to, to my hometown years ago. And yet, you know, here I am. And um, it never benefited my mother nor I. So um, the night of July 31st, 2012, I had gone through so much a displacement in the few months of losing my home in June of 2012 to then, um, in, the, in, in, in those weeks, I was um, working hard trying to earn a right into maybe somebody offering me um, uh, a boarding within their home. Um, I had maybe tried to go back into my mother's home and it wasn't a comfortable environment. And, and quickly left there, and um, and I ended up um, uh, having to leave. And um, my my twin sister urged me to leave, and and my um, my uh, my uncles and aunts said to me, "We'll give you a one way ticket to California to be with your sister." So the night of uh, July thirty first, two thousand twelve, I boarded the midnight train to LA. I came to be with my twin sister, exhausted, broken, my hope waning. Nevertheless, I was still determined to pull myself up by my bootstraps. 
The silent, still voice in me, which dared to ask myself, is this it? Was now yearning for more. Shortly after coming to LA, I can recall posting on my Facebook page, I want to discover my authentic self. I had no idea what that meant at the time. I just knew my shell of existence could not continue to sustain. Oblivious to the journey ahead of me, I continued to grasp for the hope of my American dream. However, within a few weeks of my journey to LA and in everything that defined me no longer existed, my world completely shattered. To this day, the pain remains unbearable. I continue to be shattered to my core. The very essence of my existence violated. Again, I ended up homeless, traumatized from further toxicity and abuse. I was literally drowning at this point. The more I tried to stay afloat, come up and suck air, the deeper into the water I sunk. I was broken. I tried to find, find my fight or flight mode, but my definitions uh, now of reality were unknown to me. The harder I fought to hold on to my reality of what resembled my American dream, the quicker it slipped from my hands. Sometimes I think, what the heck? This card I never saw on the deck. Um, I continued to ponder and reflect, thinking of the should have bands, remember the times when, uh, wondering what I would do differently if I could do it again. Blue, the homecoming queen, a life I once knew. Um, my make, my maker, I am, well, he had a bigger plan. Showing grace, he stroked my hand, nurturing me until I could stand, praying over me in, in my new land, praying for me not to hurt with gripe, praying for me to let go of the strife, praying for me to forgive myself and everyone else mistakes, praying for me to heal, lead me to my pearly gates. Well, willing to be a better life here on earth and in my eternal life, I wish I will, I wish I might. At this time, I pray each day and every night. Teaching, that I, teaching me that I am enough, enough. Just a small, small town girl living in a lonely world. I'm just a small town girl living in a lonely world. Living in a lonely world who took the midnight train, my life forever changed. I came to, um, I, was, I was at a, a women's safe house for the most part of my um, initial displacement um, here in LA. And um, I was um, completely um, traumatized. I cried a lot. And um, everything was completely unknown to me. And I was uh, literally, um, my family didn't know where I, I was at the time. So I was, for weeks and months, um, I was um, a missing person. I ended up in Skid Row um, December 6, 2012. At the, um, at the women's safe house in the dining hall, the women would talk about this place called Skid Row. I literally had nightmares. I had never heard of it, never been there. Um, I would um, beg, plead with my blonde, blue-eyed, white Jewish case manager, please don't send me there. In tears, I'd say, please don't send me there. She said, you have to go. There's no other place for you to go. At times telling me there's no hope. There's no hope for you. So they tried to throw me out the day before Thanksgiving. I said, you are Catholic Charities and you're going to throw a homeless woman out on the street the day before Thanksgiving? And then they said, you know what? We thought about what you said, and you're right. So they let me stay for Thanksgiving, and then they threw me out before Christmas. I came traumatized. I'd never seen anything like it. Skid Row. So many people, black people, women, aging women, right here decaying on these streets. Many times I have thought and want, wanted to turn to many of them and tell them, I pray that no one ever steals your joy. Displaced on the streets, fighting to survive, vulnerable at the hands of men, some of them even referred to as tent wives, blasphemy. I'm filled with perplexity, questioning all at this point, even in my traumatized state. Wanting to say, my heart is crying out. If I could sit across the porch from God, I'd ask him why. Why do my people continue to die? Why is a black woman measured in less sum? So much but by the time her work is added up, her sum equals none. Why do some of us have to take a hit or a score to get to 
um, to get to the store so that we don't have to feel the pain no more. Just ignore, ignore, ignore. Yeah, some say, go get that education. We live in a free nation. Make your own creation, even if it takes your life duration. Will they be penalized, criminalized, withered away and die? If I could sit across the porch from God, I'd ask him why. My fight or flight started to come in around this point. Um, I had um, gone to my uh, 25th high school reunion. I forgot to tell you that before I left home in Yuma. And these are some more pictures of um, right before I ended up displaced. And um, two minutes? Sure, yeah. <laughs> you were supposed to give me five minutes, weren't you? OK, so um, what I want to get to um, is um, these are some of the issues in regards to uh, homelessness. Um, homeless people are at a relatively high risk for a broad range of acute and chronic illness. Homelessness is associated with a number of physical and mental health issues. A relatively minor health problem can turn into a serious illness. The fact that health problems precipitated homelessness underscores the relationship among health status, employment, social support, and um, access uh, to affordable housing. Um, Trishawn Carey, I was, um, you can Google her name. Um, on March 1st, 2015, uh, LAPD shot and killed um, a homeless man by the name of Charlie Kunong. He was known in the community as Africa. So uh, Trishawn Carey uh, was in the foreground of a video which went viral and has gone um, worldwide. Uh, she can be seen picking up a police baton. She did not verbally nor physically assault any of the five or six officers. Nevertheless, um, they um, beat her up off camera. They um, put her in jail that day and they proceeded to um, uh, put over a million dollar bail over her head, a million eighty-seven thousand dollars, as well as they proceeded to try and give her a life sentence for picking up that police baton. I became chair of the Trishawn Carey committee and uh, met her post her incarceration. Um, what I've learned is that um, Brother Africa came to Skid Row because he had no place to go. You can't kill Africa. Um, poverty is trauma. Homelessness is trauma. All of these are only further exacerbated um, once dealing with the culmination. Gentr gentrification is not only about housing. Gentrification is about people, families, and communities. This is about the whole person and their overall quality of life. I'm going to leave you with um, just a last poem, and then I'll um, I have some paperwork here for you if anyone's interested. But um, I wrote a poem for um, I um, had a women's empowerment group that I um, um, that I paid for off my EBT card for um, uh, once one day a week for two years. I mean, uh, for almost two years, and um, and I had a wellness group that I did at a mental health facility uh, as well. But uh, I wrote a poem after um, the impact of the uh, gentrification issues and the um, trauma and stress that I was dealing with and that I also saw other people dealing with. I wanted a safe place that women could come to and feel the Cinderella effect minus the st evil Stepford, um, you know, mother and sisters. And so um, I uh, wrote a poem um, around the same time because the brothers would say, you know, you're a rebel and you're one of those liberated women. And I got kicked out of the church, uh, street ministry church in Skid Row. Yeah. And um, so I wrote a poem called Standing Tall for Dignity and Equality. And it reads like this. We can no longer, I'm not a liberated woman as I am, just a woman who yearns to live free. I wish to live free from the bondage of inequality, longing for equality that is yet to be. We've come far, but how far we've yet to come. Women, women are still striving for their equal sum. Whether we're sitting in the White House, Donald Trump Plaza, or up in Beverly Hills, to the lows of the Appalachians, the rundown sawmills or the Catskills. Whether your zip code is in Manhattan, New York, or right here in Skid Row. Human dignity should not come at the price for only those who can afford concierge prices and exquisite means. I humbly tell you, my voice, it is my power. It fuels me each day. It gives me the strength which surpasses none. Instead, it allows me to be more of my equal sum. Please know I'm just one voice. I've won no battles. The battles, they have yet to be won. This voice is just another gift God gave to me so I can stand tall for dignity and equality. I thank you for your time today. Thank you. OK, so we're, well, I mean, you guys can hear me. We're just going to wait for them to leave first, and then we'll transition to the room across the hall, OK? Oh, yeah. <laughs> 
as you can see. Oh, yeah. So I, I already took citrus to him and to sit like across from you. Yeah. That yeah. way it's easier to see. The okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. I realized during it, I was like, oh, I don't know what to do. <laughs> uh, yeah. So that was really like. No, no, you're totally fine. And I, the first one's going to be the hardest, and everyone after that is. So. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Anyway, thank you. Are you leaving me now? I'm leaving you, and then Marissa's going to come now. Oh. Okay, so oh, while you all are still sitting here, I wanted to let you know about um, there's a publication and research project that we did in Skid Row. Um, there's literally approximately nine public toilets for all the hundreds of people living out on the streets. Um, according to United Nations standards, people are living in less than third world living conditions. And um, uh, you can Google this, but it's called No Place to Go. And it's a publication that we've done on um, the research of um, the lack of, uh, of um, public toilets in, in, in the Skid Row area. And, um, and also, you know, there's also issues in regards to water, um, as the young lady uh, downstairs was talking about. And then there's also issues in regards to uh, food equity. And all of these end up in impacting um, someone's overall quality of life and well-being. Thank you. Okay. Right, thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you so much. Pick up the baton, as Shashan did. I urge you all to pick up the baton. Thank you. Please, thank, thank you. you so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.